This is Bonjour Chai, the Klaus Barbie edition. I'm Avi Fongold in Montreal, and I'm here with Phoebe Maltzbovi in Toronto. We are your Frozen Chosen. On today's show, we talk about the Barbie movie. We talk about Barbie Oppenheimer. We talk about is, is Barbie Jewish? Jewish? And lots of other fun stuff in and around the Jewish world coming up right after this. Phoebe, how's it going? It's going all right. How about you, Avi? Uh, it's good. Um, still summer in the city. Lots of stuff to do. Lots of exciting things happening. Um, still getting my kids ready for camp. Um, but aside from that, uh, I don't know. Been reading a lot. Been doing stuff. Eagerly anticipating. Um, Barbie. I, I, I'm actually not. <laughs> um, <laughs> you mean the Barb? So this is you're talking about the new uh, Greta Gerwig Barbie movie. Well, I'm not talking about Klaus Barbie, the uh, <laughs> former Nazi. <laughs> You're not? Oh, I'm really? not. I'm not. We frequently talk about him on this show. Um, um, it's funny because I have a friend who for a long time had um, he, a Barbie museum. Uh, he manages a mall uh, in downtown Montreal and a family member decided that like, oh, they had a huge collection of Barbies and they had a uh, big exhibit of like I've been all sorts of collectors. I have been to the Barbie exhibit in so Montreal. So it's my friend. It's a wonderful exhibit. Yes. They're actually moving it around in the mall. Apparently he told me if I spoiled anything, I'm sorry. Um, but I used to joke that there was this obscure reference in an old movie from the 90s called Rat Race where they're like traveling this family's traveling and they see this sign on the side of the road that says Barbie Museum and they turn off to the side of the road and it turns out it's a museum dedicated to Klaus Barbie oh <laughs> 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 and be, so that would be different. There are two Barbie museums and <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> very very different from each other. Yeah. The Montreal one's good. Have you been to it? Many many times. Okay. Yeah, I happened upon it completely by chance. I had no idea this was something to look for and yeah, I was there with uh, my now four and a half year old who was 5 months old at the time, so I don't know if she made much sense of it, but um yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. Barbies doing everything, all kinds of Barbies. It was great. Um I really yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. Are you anticipating the Barbie movie, though? Am I anticipating it? Well, I anticipate that it's going to open. Um, I think, uh, well, I did show the four and a half year old the trailer and she seemed somewhat interested. And I, I can't figure out whether this is a movie. I, I don't even want to say whether it's appropriate or not for a four year old, but whether there'd be it would be interesting enough for a four-year-old or whether it would just be kind of boring because it's not cartoons. So let's get into this, right? Um, you know, as our as a topic, let, I, wanted, I know that you wrote about it for the CJN and I know that you have been thinking about it. I, I've been trying not to think about it, but it's been so inevitable mm -hmm. with all of the, like, um, you know, stuff happening, uh, like, sure. in the culture around this and Oppenheimer, which actually would make it a good Klaus Barbie uh, connection, right? The Oppenheimer that's movie and the Barbie movie together. Right, that's right. So um, the Barbie movie, um, more broadly, is uh, it's this blockbuster type movie that um, is trying to be, at least per Willa Paskin's excellent New York Times magazine um, profile of the director Greta Gerwig, um, it's sort of like trying to be a clever movie about feminism and capitalism and issues of the day, but also be this kind of huge money-making movie that sells Barbie dolls. Um, so it's basically a giant ad for Barbie dolls, but kind of much like much advertising these days. Um, I don't even want to say woke because that's not right, the, quite the right word for it, but it's supposed to be very much like of the moment, kind of hip, but mainstream it's supposed to be something uh, people would not pay to watch an ad for a Barbie doll unless it's like a very, very well produced ad for a Barbie doll that seems to comment on the culture. And apparently that's what this is. And it's a so it's this huge movie starring um, Margot Robbie, who's a very attractive Australian actress, um, although a man on the Internet called her mid did you see this scandal? Uh, no, and I don't even know what that means. OK, I so I, I wrote about this for my own <laughs> newsletter. Um yeah, I'm close reading the reruns I wrote about it, which is that basically mid is a way of saying that somebody's within normal limits, but not like stunningly beautiful. And it's kind of a way of insulting somebody. Uh -huh. that they're it's mid. a neg. They're mediocre. It's a neg. Exactly. It is a neg. Um, Margot Robbie is uh, not this. She is not that thing. She looks like a Barbie doll. That's why she was, you know, that. And I'm sure her acting abilities are why she was cast to play Barbie. Um 
And also the movie also for the Canadian angle um, has Simu Liu in it. I have not seen the movie yet, but I do plan on it. I, I um, do know you like Simu Liu. I do like him, um, <laughs> but I'm the, I'm the only one. I'm the only one. He's not like the most famous handsome movie star or anything. Um, and yeah, also Ryan Gosling. They're all playing Ken dolls, apparently. So it's basically that the plastic dolls that we all know and love or hate um, are played by human actors and actresses. In, and there's some sort of a plot that involves Barbie, I guess, encountering the non-Barbie world. I have not seen this movie yet. I do plan on it. I think it seems kind of fun. Um, and yeah, I guess the question is, though, like, is it is it accomplishing anything? Like, do you have to see it to be a good feminist? I want to say no. I, I don't I don't think that that's any sort of requirement. But there are so, so many Jewish angles on this. Um, but before that, I, I, I have to ask you something, Avi. Please. Do your children have Barbies? Because mine, I think, are too young to care about Barbies. Many, many Barbies. We have okay. a, a massive dream house. We have a the airplane. Um, we have a vet set. I'm trying to remember all of the toys. Oh, the, the highlight of it is that we also have a blue Barbie Vespa that Barbie rides on and it's great because I have a blue Vespa and they think that this is hysterical. Um, but yes, um, my oldest is no longer really plays with Barbies. The middle one sort of, if she's like convinced, maybe she starts playing with Barbies. The younger one still very involved, especially if she has friends over. Um, but yes, we have a lot of Barbies. We have a lot of accessories. There's a lot of playing of Barbie that happens in our house. And did you play with Barbies yourself as a child? I did not. See, I didn't either, and um, I'm not sure what I will do if my children are interested in them, because I don't know what you do with Barbies. I, do you do something with their hair? Uh, you know, you just let them be, and this oh, is, okay. you know... Um, you just leave of... them in the, in the box? <laughs> no, no, you let okay. the ch- you let your children I, go, I to, go your, and enjoy children, playing with I their see. Barbies. It is, uh, it is a miracle of seeing how long p- kids can, especially girls, will play with Barbies mm-hmm. um, just by themselves. All right, um, but I'm I want to hear. Run out I, and buy a million Barbies. Then. I have um, more to say about this, but before that, yes. I, what are your Jewish takes about this? Like, I'm really curious because so I have so many Jewish takes <laughs> about this. Um, fear not, I always have the Jewish takes on these things. Um, so the obvious Jewish angle with Barbie is that Barbie was invented by a Jewish woman. This is something that is always sort of presented as a "Did you know?" But like mm-hmm. people, I think probably at this point did largely know who are interested in this topic which is that Ruth Handler, um, a Jewish businesswoman, um, invented the Barbie doll, and she named the doll after her daughter, Barbara. She named the male version after her son, Kenneth. So the Ken doll is um, named after her son, Ken. And it's one of these things that, um, so I wrote about this for my column this week for the CJN, but that it's like Christmas music or Ralph Lauren clothing, where it's something that, like, the vibes are not Jewish, but... Um, but it's, it is Jewish. The thing is Jewish. So a Barbie doll looks extremely stereotypically non-Jewish. Now, yes, there are other types of Barbies and there are all sorts of Jewish women. And I don't want to insult Bar Raffaele here by, I don't want to do Bar Raffaele erasure here on this podcast. Barbie Raffaele. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Um, but as Willa Paskin says in this really great article, um, that there's something like the close your eyes and think of Barbie. Barbie is how she puts it. That Barbie is very white, very blonde, very blue eyed, very um, sort of like a like a Claudia Schiffer type. But uh, to, you know, for a reference for all the young people. Um, yeah. What was fascinating about that is that and there's a reason, right? Despite. Yes. And I, I, I'll let you get into that more. But despite the fact that they tout and these stories and, you know, I was I went to H.com and H.com was going on about is Barbie Jewish and had all the facts <laughs> and the same sort of things about it. And it talks about and it really cares about the diversity. Right. That is in the Barbie world. Um, and. The problem is that as much as the diversity is there, and I don't know the sales numbers, but I know that the ste- the classic looking Barbie is always the Barbie that people imagine and think about and talk about. And who was cast to play Barbie? It was not, you know, um, like, I mean, it was, it was Margot Robbie, who's like very yeah. much Oof. blonde and Barbie looking. Yeah. So, so, so I don't buy the diversity thing. It's there. No. It's clearly they're trying hard to make it work, but all mm-hmm. the kids want to play with is the classic real Barbie. So this is actually reminding me Not that me the that... other ones aren't real. <laughs> no, but they, just, yeah. yeah. So I remember that um, at one point, I think 
my parents wanted to get me a Barbie that I would identify with and got me like Hispanic Barbie is I guess what it would have been called at the time. Mm -hmm. Because that was the one with brown hair. (laughs) Sure. Because there was like, if you, there was no, you couldn't be like a white person with brown hair or a Jewish person with brown hair, whatever. Like you had to be, you know, a person of color with brown hair because Barbie, Barbie, the, the white Barbie was the blonde Barbie. The, it's interesting how, and we've spoken about American Girl dolls uh, here in the past, um, but they have managed to at least not have a stereotypical look. Maybe they've learned their lesson from Barbie, but mm-hmm. but like you said, Barbie is still always going to be one specific thing um, for people. Yeah. More to it than just the sort of um, ethnic angle, there's also the anatomical angle or angles, um, which is that Barbies are, you know, and this is something that comes up in Willa Paskin's piece, comes up in basically every discussion of Barbie, which is that Barbies are, on the one hand, they were supposed to be innovative because they are these dolls that are not about teaching girls to nurture a baby. They're supposed to be like, it's a career woman. Barbie's this independent young woman out in the world. Um, However, Barbies are built in a way that uh, basically no actual human woman could be in terms of dimensions, in terms of lacking of you know, waste in terms of having of bust and that they would basically fall over if they were real people. I, I, I'm still failing to care. No, but the point is, (laughs) the the point is not whether you care, but the point is that historically a lot of, and this is something, again, not to keep citing Willa Paskin, but I'm going to keep citing Willa Paskin, that like uh, second wave feminists would bring up. So they were talking about like, we're not Barbies and Barbies were very much in the culture kind of mixed up with like playboy bunnies or something like that and there's always these questions of is this sexualizing something that's for children is you know i mean do i personally spend a lot of time thinking about the dimensions of barbie not really and partly it's because i think the age of the children playing with these dolls i don't know that they have like i don't think they care necessarily about i don't think they're like wishing they had bigger busts if they're like really little i don't know yeah, um, I don't know. I, I I'm not into the whole like is Barbie Jewish? It doesn't work for me. It, like all of these various pieces tend to just like cloud the discussion. Right? But what is I, the discussion? So what angle so, of it so, does so, interest you? So any? so I'll tell you a couple of things. So first of all, yeah. So the part that that I have a problem with is it highlights for me this notion of what happens when something becomes popular in culture and it happens to have a Jewish connection. Don't you know that this thing is Jewish? Don't you know that this person is Jewish? Let's find the two lines about this thing (laughs) that is Jewish. Barbie is not fundamentally like Jewish, right? There is no uh, Jewish storyline to Barbie. There is no, uh, the diversity, the diversity is universal. It happens to have a Jewish component. We love diversity in Judaism. Sure. Is there a specifically Jewish thing? Maybe we can argue. I'm going to bracket that. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, Barbie was not constructed with Jewish principles and for Jewish stuff out there in the world. It was constructed. It happened to be made by a Jewish person, right? When we see a Jewish sports player, are they doing it because they are Jewish? Are they representing Jewish values? Sometimes, usually not. But yet people are so attached to it because um I, I, I don't know i mean my thing is is that there's so little within jewish culture that is intrinsically jewish that we have to grab onto um or that we um make aware of within our community that we end up um needing to find places in general culture where we say see we're there see we're there we're also here we're also there okay. we play sports we're into toys we have famous things like that we're in this movie we're in i'm that gonna movie. throw something back at you einstein jewish Again, um, th- you know, there, there are very Jewish moments to his biography. Um, mm-hmm. is, is his general theory and special theory of relativity No, I don't mean his, I don't, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying is Einstein as a historical figure. Einstein was Jewish, yes. yes and there were definitely uh, yes. moments. Right? I, I, I think about the time when he was asked uh, to be the first president of Israel. Right, okay. He was clearly yeah. seen and perceived as a clearly Jewish character, even when he was alive. Um, he mm-hmm. was asked about Jewish stuff. He was asked about religion. Right? Was he uh, espousing Jewish philosophy uh, at, or Jewish religious thought? Pro- not usually, but at times, maybe he had some Jewish ideas. He was a smart man. Um, but that's it. Where were you going with... Yeah, I guess I think this comes back to uh, an eternal theme on this podcast, which is a sort of secular versus religious understandings of what it means to be Jewish. And to me, it seems obvious 
that there that Barbie has a Jewish history. Now, I'm oh, not I'm not trying denying to, that. But I guess I guess what I'm saying is that I think that like my understanding of Jewishness absolutely includes the history of Barbie. And to say that it's do is the Barbie doll Jewish? I mean, I made some kind of tongue in cheek remark about like counterintuitively Barbie is Jewish. This was like I was being it was a joke. Um I don't think that that I mean, it's a doll, right? Like it's a piece of plastic. I don't think a piece of plastic has a, a religion or an ethnicity for that matter. But I think to, if you're studying the Jewish people, I think of Jews as like a people. And for I sure. would say that in that context, Barbie and everything Barbie means down to like, I'm including both who invented the Barbie, but also the idea of little Jewish girls playing with these super blonde dolls. I think that's a Jewish story right there. And I think... I can see that. Um, I mean, yeah. I definitely so I I agree it's that it's that part sense. of Jewish history yeah. and it's part of yeah. a Jewish story of Jewish life in America that Jews were part of general culture in these ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that this is a particularly Jewish representation of values or ideas um, the way that people try to shoehorn them in now, right? Oh, Barbie is diverse. Barbie has this. Barbie but what has about, that. But what about, okay, so I've got to give another possibility, which is that, yes, Barbie is Jewish in a different way. Though, which is to be founded by a businesswoman like that, um, the idea of sort of Jews as, you know, sometimes entrepreneurial, but also as having as like Jewish women being out in the world in the way that maybe women from other groups wouldn't be at times. Are, are you saying that Barbie is Jewish because Barbie has a Jewish mother and is now a girl boss who made it big exactly. in America? Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying because, you know, I totally relate because I too um, invented a very lucrative plastic doll. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, uh, yeah, I, I honestly, like, it's the big story. It has a Jewish angle. We're a Jewish publication. We cover it. So sure. that's like the sort of, Here's... the, <laughs> the that's the like um, boring justification. But I, I do think there's something to it but i do i do want to kind of like stick with this angle of like the jewish girl who sees a barbie as like what people are supposed to look like because i think this is still a thing and i'm going to expand this beyond barbie specifically but like elsa from frozen you familiar i'm so glad you brought it up but please yes um this is like the icon for the little children girls especially of the moment and It's not the same as a Barbie in the sense that, like, this isn't about somebody having a giant bust and a tiny waist, but it's very much about the long blonde hair, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's um, something specifically for Jews about this where it's, like, often, not always, um, Jews will sort of read as white in North America, but maybe not entirely as white, and that there's this kind of awkwardness around figures like Elsa or Barbie, maybe, or maybe I'm just a, a throwback to the 90s when this sort of thing was relevant and nobody cares about this anymore. So I'm glad you brought up Elsa because I want to take this in a completely different direction. And okay. I'm curious for your thoughts on this. Um, I have mentioned in the past, maybe here, maybe definitely in some writing in the past, definitely in classes, where I've always looked towards Disney as being one of the great storytellers of the 20th and 21st century. Um, they know how to tell stories. They know how to get... Um, you know, children out there to come see a film, to buy the merchandise that will then expand the story into their homes and do all that stuff. And they're really good at narrative. They're really good at connecting with people on that. Um, And I was trying to compare and contrast it to what's going on with Barbie and with this film, um, especially in light of this article that I uh, read, uh, which was had really turned my head around. Um, I don't know if you saw this article by Perul Segal in uh, The New Yorker, uh, The Tyranny of the Tale, um, about how we've become this like world of like storytellers and storytelling has taken over everything. And from branding to uh, statistic interpreta- statistical interpretation, and we need stories, we need stories, we need stories. And sh- she says that it's time for us to retire this trope of storytelling um, as this like central thing that humanity has. And um, I don't want to get too far into it, but it really turned my head around because I do believe in storytelling. I do believe in narratives, um, but I do agree with her that it is something that is sometimes overused. Um, but Judaism as a, at its core is a storytelling people. Um, the Torah is a set of tales and in, in addition to a set of laws. And the reason why these tales are there is because they, you see values um, 
sometimes being misused, sometimes being used, um, but you learn from them and the rabbis use stories in addition to create, sto- they, they create stories on top of the stories in the Torah, we call them midrashim, that will go and help us interpret. And they know that stories help us really shape who we are, especially when we're seeing big stories um, that can impact us. Um, the thing that I found fascinating about Barbie is that the toys are just a tool for girl storytelling, Generally girls. I know that boys play with Barbies. I'm not trying to, I only have girls. That's what I see. But there's this notion of you buy Barbies and you buy these sets of different things. You buy the Malibu Dream House and you buy the car and you buy the Vespa and all of these other things. And they just start telling stories amongst themselves with this. And I was like, oh, what happens when there's a movie um, that's going to sort of like canonize the story of Barbie. And I know there have been other stories uh, told of Barbie, right? There was Barbie, Dreamhouse, Vacation. It's a, I, I've seen there's there were animated series about Barbies. There were novels about Barbies in the past, but they really seemed ancillary to the general thing of Barbie, which is buy Barbies. Here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Create stories for yourself about it. Can I reassure um, you there on please. two levels? So one is that I think this movie is for grownups and not for children. And certainly not for Barbie age, like the age of children playing with Barbies. So it's rated PG-13, but it's also just like, it's the type of movie grownups are going to go out to see. I don't know that a lot of like eight-year-olds are going to be seeing it or five-year-olds or whatever. Um, So that's one thing. And the other is that I see how children do their kind of like frozen playing and they make stuff up all the time. And it's like, yeah. Like I I said, I've seen the frozen thing also. But what I found fascinating is that Disney starts with this narrative and then sells you merch and then the stories become this expansion of it. It's kind of like like the way I was thinking about it, like with the Torah. You have these stories of Abraham and Moses and David Mm -hmm. and all these things. And then the rabbis create these narratives that expand Mm -hmm. on it, Mm -hmm. right? Abraham Mm -hmm. smashed the idols. That's not in the Torah. People think that it is, but it's not. It's in a Midrash, but it teaches us about what kind of an iconoclast literally Mm -hmm. Abraham was right he smashed icons um so so there's this thing where it goes in one direction whereas with Barbie it tends to be flatter or goes in the other direction where Mm -hmm. you've had decades of girls playing with this stuff and then that informs Mm -hmm. the storytelling that's there Mm -hmm. um that's probably what's happening with the movie I haven't seen it yet um I don't know if I ever will. Maybe I will. I don't know. Um, but like there's, it just turned my head around. Like, like I said, I, I, I started thinking about it as like, well, what happens when you start with these open narratives and you canonize it into a story? Um, maybe that is the ancient way, which, you know, the, mm-hmm. th- these stories got told, right? People had these stories of Gilgamesh and these stories of this and these stories of that. And then they get canonized into these epics. Um, and we're going to leave open the question of what happens with the Torah, you know, and how that worked mm-hmm. with that. But I just, that was the fascinating angle to me was that as a story telling people we are so into stories and we start so into narrative and none of these is Barbie Jewish ever mentions this idea that like, Oh, right. Here's an opportunity to tell stories. Barbie was an opportunity for girls to have a way to tell stories the way that they had with paper dolls before, but in a much more expanded universe. I think that's really interesting. And I think I'm going to have to agree with you that like the is Barbie Jewish angle is not the most compelling here. I mean, I, I think the part of it that captivates me, if any does is this idea of like, the hyper feminine as being like counterintuitively the actually feminist thing. Um, But that is probably beyond the scope of Bonjour High. So I may have to leave it at that. that. I think we will leave it there. So Um, yeah, Um, that's really my take, my thoughts. Um, I'm curious to see the movie itself. What are the values that it represents? Maybe it does represent great values, Um, but I would encourage if I was giving a sermon and I'm trying not hard not to give a sermon here. Um, but to sort of say, like, think about when you played Barbie, think about when your kids are playing Barbies and how there's commentary on your life. Right. I think that's the value of Barbie is that it's a reflection of what's going on around these kids lives using these fantasy toys um, that are out there. And the film itself is a story. But but Barbie is really a million stories. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's wise. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I wanted you to say, no, it's not no, true. No, no, exactly- Bobby, <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> um, yeah. We'd love to hear what you think. Send us an email, bonjour at the cjn.ca. Let's get to some other news of the Jewish world, maybe after we hear from the sponsors. Sounds good. Are you in the market for a new watch or a special piece of jewelry? Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring to pop the question? Atelier Lou has all this and more. Eric and the team at Atelier Lou can craft a piece for you, or you can select from some of the exclusive designers that they offer. From a simple bangle to a statement necklace, Atelier Lou can make you or your loved ones sparkle. 
Located in the heart of Westmount in Montreal or online at atelierlou.com, visit Atelier Lou for your next watch or jewelry purchase. And when you do, make sure to use promo code BON18 for 10% off your next purchase. That's atelierlou.com. So uh, in my world, so I'm American, as you all know, um, and I see that uh, Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr., I'm now quoting from the New York Post, dished out wild COVID-19 conspiracy theories, okay, on the on the Upper East Side, even that my home neighborhood. Um, so he apparently, um, they caught him on video saying, uh, quote, there is an argument that it is ethnically targeted. I have no idea what he sounds like, by the way. I'm just trying to sound like a man. There is an argument that is ethnically targeted. COVID-19 attacks certain races disproportionately, Kennedy said. COVID-19 is targeted to attack Caucasians and black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese. End quote. Okay. So he's saying that he doesn't know whether this was deliberate or not, but he's saying that that's... Um, that's the COVID thing. And yeah, when I saw this, um, my first thought was, I mean, I've had COVID a bunch of times. I am, as far as I know, 100% Ashkenazi Jewish. Um, and it did not not get me. <laughs> and I couldn't smell anything like twice in my life from this. And it was terrible. And and my, my from my Jewish nose, I could smell nothing. Um for for like weeks and it was bad i got COVID too i know mm -hmm. many ashkenazi jews got COVID. so but that might have been your yeah. your susceptibility um from your moroccan side uh perhaps that's true i have uh i have susceptibility <laughs> the opposite of immunity i was trying to figure out what's the word anyways um yeah rfk i mean he seems he seems lovely the best take that i heard about this was uh from actually acquaintance of mine who wrote this great piece uh in the forward of via kushner uh, where she went and she said, uh, there's a Jewish idea that a person is known by koso, kiso, and kaso. I'm quoting her, his cup, his pocket, and his anger, meaning his behavior after he drinks, his attitude towards money, and how he handles anger. Um, I thought back to the early days of the Trump campaign where I, when I overheard a bunch of guys in, in a diner talking as all TVs in the place turned to Trump coverage. One said, he says what I think out loud. And then another guy said something like, he says what we're all thinking out loud. I just love the guy. Then laughter. RFK Jr. showed us that it just takes a bit of booze to get to that unattractive honesty out of the bottle. Good thing the New York Post got it all on video, right? So there's this idea that like, great, he was drinking and he said this stuff and this is actually finally somebody who's saying out loud what they're thinking and you should get to know somebody like that and that that's the danger of what's going on with RFK and not the like big anti-Semitic tropes of Jews carrying disease and stuff like that. So I'm like, yeah, this is finally but somebody how is saying it? I guess loud. I'm a little bit confused about how these are separate from each other because isn't this about the anti-semitic for sure yeah, yeah yeah but i'm saying that's not the interesting part the interesting part is great he thinks about this right many many people think about it right the fact that there's a presidential candidate that is willing to say this out loud even when they're drunk right so now you know about this i guess I, i'm wondering whether how many people do think like this because to me that sounds very fringe and in, insofar as this is the first time i've heard that the first time you've heard what that COVID spared Jews and Chinese, Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese oh, people. Oh, that specific thought. They oh. need to go over to Stuyvesant sure. High School and uh, see if anybody got COVID. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I haven't been diving deep into the world of COVID conspiracies. Um, I mean, I'm but, sure there are tons of them. So but, great. He said out loud the things that are people quiet. So, you think so, now, that's, so do you think that's good that he said it out loud? I, I hope that the world of uh, the potential voters of for for rfk jr in the u.s might actually be the types of people who say oh great he said this out loud let's actually not vote for this guy uh, what if they say oh great he said it out loud let's vote for him um again you're <laughs> then, <laughs> then we get to see what america is really all about um and yeah it that's could about go, it. i would not be shocked i mean it could go anyway yeah so that's um that was an interesting one um and then there's also this moms for liberty where they posted some that some conservative group that posted a quote from Hitler and then had to walk that back. So there's a lot of fun stuff happening now in the U.S. Um, I, I I was thrown for a loop by this story. Uh, there's an individual by the name of Ahmad Alush, uh, Swedish, who uh, was trying to protest a response to a Quran burning that was that happened outside of a Stockholm mosque last month by an Iraqi Christian during uh, Eid al-Adha, which is a Muslim holiday. They granted him a permit to hold a public rally to burn a Jewish and a Christian Bible. Uh, there was discussion about whether that was going to include, because he had made it seem like he was going to include a Torah uh, 
as part of this burning um, pr- process, uh, protest, and the thing to know about that is, uh, you know, if a Torah gets destroyed, so for example, a Torah that gets destroyed gets buried just like a human in Jewish uh, thought, right? It gets a burial, it gets a plot, um, especially one that's destroyed in a uh, particularly uh, sad way, like if a synagogue gets burned, uh, you know, gets caught on fire, if uh, something you know, gets violated in this way. So it's really a sad thing for a Torah scroll to be burned, for a Torah in general, for a, a book to be burned. I, I'm a big, I'm not a big fan of book burnings in general, um, even though technically they might be considered protected speech. And so after this international uproar, especially after some uh, pushback from within the Muslim community, uh, he decided not to do this. He said he, his intention was never to do it, just to show the limits of free speech and to talk about it and, and to have this as part of the discussion. Um, and and I think that's exactly what happened with me in that it, you know, on the one hand, I w- I've been of this mind of like, hey, maybe maybe we should be allowed to draw pictures of Muhammad. And I'm not saying that there's comparisons or whatever, but like. So it's, it's basically the, the stakes here seem to be that um, there's been a lot of free speech discussions, starting with like, especially the Charlie Hebdo um, publication in France about whether it's okay to do a caricature of the prophet Muhammad. Because yeah, so that's Islam, not specifically okay. what he was talking about, okay. but that has been part of the discussion around free okay, speech. So yes. I was just going to say that like in Islam, whether intended as satirical or not, you're not supposed to have images of the prophet Muhammad. Like Correct. Visual, sometimes I think it yes. sounds like a very, so what I was going to say is that this also has come up in academia where I think some adjuncts got fired possibly for showing in an art history class, an image of the prophet Muhammad because the student complained. So like, this is something that comes up all the time in terms of free speech, academic freedom, free expression, and all of this, both in the sense of um, like something akin to the burning of a sacred document, but also so like where it's there's some sort of analogy where something's satirical, but also just the the showing of the image at all. Yeah. So okay. so that's where I was like thinking about it and mm-hmm. my mind went to that. But com- in comparison to saying, well, you're free to burn any books, but if you burn a Torah or you burn a like even a printed Torah, like that seems like it's a tragedy for me. And I'm not I'm not in a position to stop you physically. You're you're half a world away. But what kind of a world did we um, create where people think that it's okay to do that um, just to spite a people and to go and say, you see, these are the limits of free speech. Um and and that really like you know I I started thinking about it and I think that like that's says less about the hatred that people feel for Jews for Muslims for any other sort of group where they want to have um, speech against them but more to the world in which we have created that is a world now where um, somebody would actually consider doing something that is so hateful to another to another faith um, and we're supposed to be in this better world of cooperation and good stuff but uh, but Are apparently we? we're not I don't know like we, <laughs> is we're, this we're supposed so to be a better world enlightened but I don't think that's that this no. is the type of yeah. actions that remind us that we're not always in such a good world. Um, yeah. I can't say that I was under the impression that we're in such a good world. I'm just thinking about like Russia, um, for example. Yeah. I don't know. Parts of the world. It's are, the are Steven Pinker there. argument of yeah. there are fewer killings and yeah. murders happening in this world yeah. than any other time. Has, but has, he, has he checked in on, on the world recently, Steven Pinker? Yeah, maybe not. Because um, I think it's interesting. Yeah, this question of free speech. I mean, I think I, I'm a big fan of free speech, you know, big old American First Amendment, all that. But I think the idea of doing something as a stunt just to show that you can does not appeal to me and seems like not really the way to... Like, I think it should be... People should be free to speak out as they... Like, in, I don't want to say, like, you have to have your intentions assessed because obviously you don't, but the idea of just, like, doing stunts to say what you can do in a way that's going to be upsetting to people seems... Um, probably unnecessary because I feel like there are enough people insulting religion earnestly that you don't really need yeah. to do stunts to get there. I don't think we should be insulting religion in general, but... Do you think we should know. be insulting secularism? <laughs> no, no, I don't think we should be insulting people, period. I think you can you can argue based on the ideas. You can mm-hmm. argue based on uh, values and say you have great values, but I think we come at it from different points or you have bad values and this is why I think your values are bad. Um, but to go and say, here's a book that you think is sacred, I think nothing of it. I guess he's basically saying, I hold nothing about this text and I'm going to burn it. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe... 
burning crosswords would be offensive to Will Shorts, and <laughs> and and we shouldn't do that. Even or maybe if, maybe if he that, has so many lying around that that's how he starts his own. Fires. Perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, so what's um, the story, yeah. Avia? Here you have another story for us. Um, yes, I, I just, I, I love this. I thought that was so funny. It was just such a funny image that um, this is a story in The Guardian about uh, the Israel Antiquities Authority uh, apparently had lent some rare antiquities to the White House for a Hanukkah celebration back in 2019, um, and they haven't got them back yet, and they assume that they are holed up somewhere in Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> and I, it brought back images of when we were talking about Michael Stein Hart and his antiquities being stuffed like in uh, above like <laughs> kitchen cl- cabinets and all around and I'm like I'm thinking about Trump lighting a, a cigar with a rare antiquity because it just happens to be around and he goes you see this I got this from Israel and I haven't given it back yet now, now they're claiming that this was all a misunderstanding that they're just they got caught up because of COVID and they haven't had a chance to get them back um, but I I just was like wow right so in addition to highly classified documents Trump has thousands of year old antiquities um, from Israel that are extremely rare and need to get back there but i don't know if we'll ever see them back so do you how many antiquities do you have lying around your house i have uh zero antiquities unless you count me um (laughs) as an old man um i i don't think i i'm not antiquities not my thing i'm obsessed with these stories about the antiquities as well um because yeah there was another in the new york times some woman who um who was like this big philanthropist um who had been kind of credited with like preserving antiquities whatever and then it's like yep go to these people's apartments and apparently they're always chock full of antiquities that they shouldn't have. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me as somebody who like looks at posters on Etsy and thinks, can I really justify that $15 purchase that I don't really need? And it's like, then there's like somebody down the street, perhaps with, uh, probably not down the street here, but, um, yeah, who knows? Probably somewhere in Toronto, somebody's got a lot of antiquities. Um, don't know where. Yeah. Um, they're, they're out there. They're in the ground. They're just, very died like waiting to be all of our yards yes. all of our yards could for all we know <laughs> absolutely where they're cut yeah. Um, before we get to our nachas, um, I do want to take a moment um, because, you know, uh, many f- uh, of the readers have actually gotten the CJN Summer Magazine out. Uh, we are hard at work on the Fall Magazine already. I know you and I have been uh, working on bits for the Fall Magazine. We're, the, the magazine, I think, is a labor of love and a reinvention of what we think the CJN um, is going towards. And I just want to use it as an example of the way in which we have reinvented the CJN as a podcast network, as a magazine that has um, great stories that are in-depth, that have great artwork attached to them and is in a constant. We we are reinventing more and more. We we have great plans for the magazine. um, And we really haven't done much of this lately uh, or at all, um, but we will occasionally. We're not doing a full-on pitch drive for every week for the next six weeks, whatever it is. But um, but we do want to remind people that uh, we are a nonprofit. We are always uh, in peril of being canceled by the Canadian government, of course, and the uh, the big Facebook and uh, Google consortiums for not canceled, you know, not canceled for problematic. <laughs> problematic. Although, no, no, no. They just because yeah. of the news issues, and and you can go on the CJN to read more about this and to go on. Just, around to find out how news organizations in Canada are are being blocked ac- from from access. Um, we want uh, you guys, if you've been listening to Bonjour High and you've been enjoying it, um, to help the CJN, uh, to donate, to give us, I don't know, eight bucks a month, which is uh, a good round number, not quite a round number, but eh, whatever. Um, and uh, help us um, with a you know, with an $8 donation a month, we'll, we'll send you the magazine every quarter to your house directly. Uh, we will keep being able to produce Bonjour High. We will uh, be coming up with amazing-ish shows like the Great Canadian uh, Seder, the Great Canadian Sermon Slam, which we are hard at work at getting uh to you in time for the high holidays this year. Um, We're always happy to take more than $8 a month, but we think that we are worth investing in and we would like to ask you to invest in Bonjour Chai and in the CJN in general. Um, You can email us at bonjour at the cjn.ca. Let us know, like, did does this move you? Are is there other things that might move you better to give a give us a, a, some sort of donation? Um, but really, 
we'd love to know if Mojo High is uh, the primary way that you consume the CJN. Are there other ways you consume the CJN? Um, but please help us out. Um, and you can easily go to the cjn.ca slash donate to uh, donate $8 a month um, and really help us out. And uh, for that, you get, like I said, you get a quarterly magazine mail to you. You get the satisfaction of knowing that you're part of this team. And uh, we consider you as part of the team and we really would love that help. So thank you. Yes, uh, everything Avi said, plus, plus, we will be having a uh, sub stack of our very own. Ooh, that is true. We are that planning is, that. Um, it's going to be a newsletter that, uh, to be determined, the, the exact parameters, but it'll be basically like our email newsletter for this podcast um, that will also have sort of a function as like a, a community, a virtual community gathering space for Bolger High listeners. Yeah. So uh, stay tuned. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Phoebe, what's your nachas this week? Well, it, my nachas this week, and I'm going to have to give the caveat that this has been a lot of um, home with small children kind of days. So I do not have a ton of nachas from out in the world of um, doing things. But um, I did follow some extremely entertaining stuff on Twitter. Sorry, you know, as one does. Um, and specifically, so there's this account, Derek Guy at Die course, Workwear. Die Workwear. Um, that's this sort of endlessly entertaining um, account that's just like commenting on like anything can be happening in the world. But he's like, how does this man's suit fit? And it's just like... And, and it's like really earnest and um, that, it has admirers. It, it has, um, yeah, it, it has its admirers. It has its detractors. I mean, I don't feel like strong emotions about this anyway, but I just love this thread that he did about um, the King of Spain. And he writes about the King of Spain. Very rare to see this level of tailoring nowadays. And he has a picture of the King of Spain in a suit at Wimbledon. Okay, even on the wealthy. So let's talk about some of the reasons why it's great. And then he has a thread emoji. Which, did like, you know that? Did you know that I is... used to be the king of Spain, and now I eat humble pie? <laughs> I, I figured as much. No. Um, oh. Yes, yes, yes. Um, basically, the king of Spain's looking good. He's he's well tailored, and this, um, like, it's clear what he's trying to say here. And he has it's a long thread with like photos of other wealthy people who he says are not well tailored. So he's not saying, "Oh, look at this king has a nice suit," but it's also funny because it's like, "Look at this, the king has a nice suit." Um, you know, if I were the king of Spain, I would like to think that I would not be wearing this extremely attractive Everlane t-shirt from probably, a, from back when I lived where the land of Everlanes is not last week. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, you know, I, I pulled up this picture. I, mm -hmm. I would think the same thing. I, I like, I like his collar. I like the spread and not being, you know, you know, it's a, it's a nice spread collar. It's Is a nice it? colored suit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a Do you agree that there's pants. no pulling uh, anywhere and that the, the things hang cleanly? That's correct. This is, okay. this is a, this is a suit that is clearly tailored for him. Um, it is not in this fashion of like these crazy, crazy narrow lapels with the, mm -hmm. with the notch, like, right, like basically almost at your nose so high up. It's like, it's got a nice proportion to it. Um, he's matching patterns, uh, meaning like he's able to contrast patterns in a nice professional way. Maybe he has a dresser maybe he's doing it himself um but he's he's well dressed he's, i think like, he I like went to zara which is spanish right zara uh, yes yes i think he went to zara and just first thing he saw at the sale rack he was like i'll go with that i can tell you 100 percent that nothing on him right now probably <laughs> down to the underwear is not from zara do you think um, the underwear is tailored too possibly or maybe it's hanro or zimmerly or um sunspell those are the like the really 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 high end uh, right uh, underwear that uh, men go for really I'll, oh yes I'll, there's like this culture of like hundred dollar super comfortable heritage underwear um i don't think this is yeah wow this is a whole world we're of, making it jewish we're gonna we call gotkas. it gotkas we call them gotkas in my household but our go. gotkas are like not not quite like yeah. this um yeah yeah i mean mine are always too long i have to like my um pajama pants always have to like roll them up because I'm so short, but I never mm -hmm. thought of getting them personally tailored. But if I were the king of Spain, it's Perhaps possible I would. would. But there were some funny parodies of this and they're like gentle parodies. Nobody's bullying Derek Guy here. It's, mm -hmm. it's just funny where somebody had, uh, somebody named Keith Humphreys has a tweet 
Very rare to see this level of tailoring nowadays, even on the wealthy, the shirt and collar hug, that plump little body, and the lack of pants that says, hey, I accept myself completely. Why can't you? And it has a picture of Winnie the Pooh. And this just really well, cracked me up. And Winnie the Pooh is a coded reference to uh, Boris Johnson, I believe. And- <laughs> It could be. It could be. So yeah, um, I always notoriously enjoy... underdressed. And improperly dressed. <laughs> I enjoy the the original earnest um, reverence for the menswear, and I also kind of enjoy the the gentle mockery that it receives. I will always. So think that's my nachas. Avi, I want to know yours. What's your nachas? For um, me? I have two brief nachas devoted to our uh, story that we had earlier t- uh, before our, our discussion. Um, one is uh, our friend Yael Buckler, who has been on the podcast before and uh, posted a picture this week, um, said getting ready. And she had two challahs that had pink and white sprinkles on them with a Shabbat Shalom challah cover that was clearly in the Mattel Barbie uh, font. Um, I thought that was really cute to have uh, Barbie challah Barbie, uh, Barbie challahs. Um, and I it's I can't go an episode without shouting out uh, my friend uh, Jen Taylor Friedman, whose story has been told many, 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 many times. And you can go search for the story yourself. Um, but she uh, actually made a very, very Jewish Barbie. She called it to fill and Barbie. Um, it had a nice long uh, Mora core skirt before it was cool and it was still just Mora's and she had fashion. She herself is a soferet. She is a scribe and she fashioned a little tefillin on them. And what is that? Oh, she, like piece. she writes out like the Torah itself. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. And so she fashioned little uh, tefillin, not actual kosher tefillin, but uh, tefillin and a talus to put on Barbie. And she was selling them for a little while through her website, through whatever. They're in art museum collections as this like she made. Are they in the Barbie. Montreal exhibit? They are not. But they uh, should be. In, they should be there in other Jewish museum exhibits okay. around the world, I do believe. Um, we should uh, we should talk about that. For sure. Anyways, so yes, shout out to Jen Taylor Friedman for creating the most Jewish Barbie there excellent, was. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for the week ending July 22nd, Shabbat Parashat Devarim. The show is produced and edited by Zach Kaufman. The executive producer for CJN Podcasts is Michael Freeman. Our music is by So Called. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you told a friend about Bonjour Chai. It is one of the best ways we get new listeners. As always, you can email us with comments at bonjour at the cjn.ca. I'm Avi Feingold. I'm Phoebe Maltz-Bovey. Thanks for joining.